I was just your average modern English lad, chasing after women, making money, and getting on it with my pals was the motive. It's what life seems to boil down to. I reached the point where I was just sick of it all. The empty raving, the shallow relationships, and the monotonous work, and the pointlessness of everything, given the fact that sooner or later we're all going to die and be forgotten. I remember thinking, there has to be more to life than this. I had a relatively sheltered childhood, but our area was fairly rough. Gangs of lads would often deal drugs on my street in broad daylight. This meant I wasn't allowed to play out with the local kids who used to mooch about all over. I found this so unfair. How come I'm not allowed out when everyone else is? From my childish perspective, I couldn't see that my parents weren't letting me play out for my own good. They could see how letting me befriend kids who had no discipline or moral values would come to harm me in the future. They weren't just restricting me for the sake of it. I later learned that this is exactly how God is. He sets boundaries for us because he can see the bigger picture that we can't from our finite perspective. My parents were ex-missionaries, so I was immersed in their faith from an early age. I attended church every week when I'd have much rather been out on the Sunday League footy pitch. I knew a bit about Jesus, but I didn't know Jesus. I had a basic understanding of the gospel, but I never had that personal connection with him that only comes with total surrender. Like most kids, what I craved most was to fit in and be accepted. My overwhelming desire to be like everyone else, coupled with my parents' crumbling marriage, caused me to deny the existence of God altogether. What good is God if he can't keep my parents together anyway? I grew to resent their superstitions and the boundaries they set for me. I remember thinking, if God is anything like that, then I want nothing to do with him. So I did everything in my power to distance myself from their faith. Until childhood was nothing more than an embarrassing memory, occasionally used to roast me by my mates from primary school. Q, hedonism. For those of you who don't know, hedonism basically means living for pleasure. It's the do whatever makes you feel good type of lifestyle. Many of you are probably hedonists without it ever crossing your mind. For the duration of high school and college, I dismantled any moral baggage I had left. Just went on one. Shoplifting, taking and distributing drugs, drinking myself legless, sex, fighting, you name it, I did it all while getting decent grades and holding down a job. I remember watching Zeitgeist for the first time at 17. If you haven't seen it, it's a left-wing pseudo-documentary that makes the case for various conspiracy theories, one of which being that Jesus never existed because Horus was a sun god, which sounds a bit like the son of God, so Illuminati confirmed and all that. And of course, I just lapped it up. Of course it was all a hoax. An old friend of mine once said, well no hero of mine even, that religion is the opium of the people. With so many thousands of religions out there, all contradicting each other, who's to say any of these primitive myths are anything more than just man's pathetic attempts to explain his own existence? I was just your average modern English lad, chasing after women, making money and getting on it with my pals was the motive what life seems to boil down to. I reached the point where I was just sick of it all. The empty raving, the shallow relationships, and the monotonous work, and the pointlessness of everything, given the fact that sooner or later we're all going to die and be forgotten. I remember thinking, there has to be more to life than this. My hedonism evolved as I realised that I got more pleasure and satisfaction out of achieving things that are difficult to accomplish and take longer. So I threw myself at the gym and transformed my naturally twiggy physique into what you see in these photos. I started reading books on self-improvement which taught me to be proactive and succeed in the workplace. I settled down with a girlfriend and focused on building a shared life. 
got my first tattoo and started planning how I would turn my body into a masterpiece. All the while I had this one nagging thought. It was, why? People die all the time. I could be in a car crash, get cancer, fall down a lift shaft or die in a million other ways and all my hard work, dream, ambitions would come to nothing. Life is just a flash in a pan, a spark in an endlessly vast expanse of darkness. Now you see it, now you don't. So why bother? Train spotting communicates this perfectly, but don't worry, I won't try a Scottish accent because mine's bad enough. Well, maybe two words. Choose life, choose a career, choose a family, choose good health, low cholesterol and dental insurance. Choose Facebook, Twitter and Instagram, hoping that somebody somewhere cares. Human interaction reduced to nothing but data. Choose handbag, choose high heeled shoes, cashmere and silk to make yourself feel what passes for happy. Choose an iPhone made in China by a woman who jumped out of a window. And stick it in the pocket of your jacket fresh from the South Asian fire trap. Choose unfulfilled promises and wishing you'd done it all differently. Choose disappointment. Choose losing the ones you love and as they fall from view, a piece of you dies with them until you can see that one day in the future, piece by piece, they will all be gone and there will be nothing left of you to call yourself dead or alive. Choose rotting away at the end of it all, in a miserable home, nothing more than an embarrassment to the selfish brat you have spawned to replace yourself. Choose life. Why not shoot heroin until you overdose? No, seriously, why not? Atheist philosopher Albert Camus puts it this way. There is but one truly philosophical problem, and that is suicide. Judging whether life is or is not worth living amounts to answering the fundamental question of philosophy. You see, without a creator, Mine and your existence has no ultimate meaning, no ultimate value, and no real purpose. Without a creator, we are nothing more than biological robots dancing to our DNA in a universe that couldn't care less. Some of you are probably thinking, well even if that's the case, it doesn't mean your God exists. Well you're absolutely right. I'm just stating a fact acknowledged by most serious thinkers. But this leads to, in my opinion, the most compelling argument for the existence of God. Now, get ready, because when the penny first drops, your head just might fall off. Fall off, so prepare to catch it. If we, and the universe with us, have no ultimate purpose, then good and evil, right and wrong, are nothing more than an illusion. Hear me out. Think of a game of football. The purpose is to score goals and prevent the other team from scoring goals. A shot is a good shot when it comes close to scoring a goal, and a bad shot is a bad shot when it goes nowhere near. Take the purpose out of football and what are you left with? People kicking a ball aimlessly wherever they want. There's no such thing as a good or a bad shot when there's no purpose. Right, now stay with me. Imagine you're an astronaut free floating in space. For something to be up or down, it needs a reference point, something to go off. Well, what do I mean by that? Well, imagine you're looking at Earth. You're either above it, below it, or you're next to it. Now take Earth away and you're just floating. You aren't up or down because there's no reference point. It's the same with morality. Without God as an objective reference point, creating us for a purpose, good and evil, and nothing more than societal preferences. Nothing is truly right or truly wrong in any meaningful sense. This goes against every instinct we have as humans. We hear about the Holocaust, about racism, about terrorism. Our sense of justice tells us that that is evil and wrong. In every case, at any time. But the reality is, if God doesn't exist, then your views on justice and equality are just as equally valid as Hitler's. Let that sink in. Picture me, I'm in Sydney, Australia, sat on my bed. I'm in a shared flat above a Domino's pizza spot. I know, right, talk about convenience. My little brother has just given his life to Jesus a few months prior, so I decided to do a bit of research myself. There I am watching and 
reading countless different dialogues from the people at the front line of these discussions from all different worldviews and it just dawns on me if God exists that means he owns me if God exists it means he gets to make the rules maybe we get upset when people die because deep down we know something is fundamentally wrong with this world that it shouldn't be this way Maybe we think some things are absolutely right and absolutely wrong because we're made to have God as a reference point. Maybe we live our lives like they have value, purpose and significance because they actually do. Maybe we are more than just bags of highly evolved biological waste. Maybe the worldview that gave us science brought an end to slavery and filled the world with hospitals and schools. Maybe that worldview needs to be taken more seriously. Maybe the man who claimed to be the way, the truth and the life. The same man who was seen alive after his public execution. Maybe he knows something I don't. Maybe he can see the bigger picture. You see, the more I learned about Jesus, the more I saw how completely unique he is compared to every other religious leader. Almost every other prophet, pope or guru will tell you that to get to heaven, paradise, nirvana, whatever, you have to follow steps X, Y and Z. If you follow them correctly, then maybe, just maybe, you might make it. Jesus is the only one who says, nah, it's not about what you do, it's about what I've done. Almost every prophet, pope or guru will tell you that you're not a bad person. Just try a bit harder, pray a bit, meditate a bit, and be a bit kinder, then all the bad things you do will just be ignored. Because all that really matters is that you're a good person. Jesus is the only one who says, nobody is good but God, and you have broken his law. Think about it for a moment. Criminals are put on trial for the good stuff they do. So why would the judge of the universe be any different? When's the last time a police officer has congratulated you for keeping the law? It doesn't happen. They didn't drag Jeffrey Epstein in and then let him off the hook because he donated money to charity. On a serious note, do you really think you can reject the one who gave you life? Use his name as a word to express disgust. Put yourself first your whole life for him to just pat you on the back because you sent a shoebox to Africa once? No, that's just not how the law works. Bottom line is, we will all have our day in court and we will all be found guilty of breaking the law. But I thought God loves me, I hear you ask. So remember how before I mentioned that it's not about what you do, it's about what he's done. But what exactly did he do? Many of you probably heard that he died on the cross 2,000 years ago. But what does that mean for my life now? Well, put in legal terms, Jesus took your place on death row so that even though you're guilty, God can dismiss your case because Jesus served your sentence. It's what's known as the great exchange. Jesus for you and me. This is the only way God chooses to express his love for rebels like you and me while still upholding justice by allowing Jesus to take your place. Let's be honest, the world is a mess. You and I are part of the problem. The good news of the gospel is not that we can work our way out of the mess, but that God has already stepped into the mess to offer us a way out. The question is, how should we respond to this kind of love? Like with any gift, we have to receive it, but how? In Mark 1.15, Jesus commands people to one, repent, and to two, believe the good news. Repent means to stop going in that direction, Turn 180 and go the other direction. Stop doing the things that God says are wrong and start living for him. Take your identity and self-worth out of temporary things like your career, social status and sexuality and instead put it in Jesus. Who does he say that I am? What does he want me to do? So that's the repent part. Then there's a the belief part. Believe that Jesus took your place. Trust Jesus to save you from God's judgment the same way you trust the parachute to save you from the effects of gravity. The moment you do this, Jesus will give you a new life. You'll start feeling different, thinking different, behaving different, as you allow the Holy Spirit to change you from the inside out. He did it for me, and he will do it for you. 
sat in my room above Domino's Pizza, the smell of sizzling pepperoni violating my nostrils. I chose eternal life. I chose Jesus. We all have that same decision to make. To either eternal life or death, heaven or hell. Don't choose life. Choose eternal life. Hang on a minute, mate. What happened next? Why should I believe a book written by men? God exists, then what's with all the pain and suffering? Why not Islam, Buddhism, Scientology? Doesn't science disprove God? How do we know that this Jesus bloke even existed? Who created God then? Hold on a second, we'll get to it. If you want to hear what happens next in my story, and you'd like to hear a really good answer to some of those questions, then please subscribe to Read Good Ministries. If you'd like to give your feedback, please slap a like or dislike on the video or send us an email at reachgoodministries at gmail.com. Thank you so much for putting up with me and may God lead us into all truth.